presentation. Um, the focus and subject of the talk is all about regenerative braking on electric bicycles. And it's a topic that you don't hear about nearly as much as you should, and something that's pretty near and dear to my heart. Um, and so I'll do my best to go both in sufficient technical details, so for those of you with a bit of a technical background will appreciate it, but not being slogged down in math and numbers. Um, so hopefully I found the right balance here, and I look forward to starting off on this talk. Uh, so first off, just a very basic, if this is a new uh, area for you, is what is regenerative braking? Um, and that is, of course, using the motors that you use to propel a bicycle to repurpose them as a brake to help slow the bicycle down. And one of the nice features and characteristics of pretty much every single type of electric motor is that they're completely bidirectional. Every single motor that can generate torque when you feed it electricity can also produce electricity if you force that motor to spin. So it's one of the beautiful symmetries of electric drives, and there's no parallel analog in the world of combustion engines or human power. You can't coast down a hill and then have a pedal spin and then work your legs up and you know, make you burp out a cheeseburger sandwich or something. Um, chemical reactions, chemical energy production tends to be a one-way path, but electrical is, uh, goes both ways. And so that uh, characteristic of electric motors is one of the key reasons why electric cars have so much, much better mileage and energy efficiency than gas cars. To move a car, an electric car, in theory, should take more energy than a gas car because typically they're heavier, but because of the efficiency gains of being able to harvest that uh, kinetic energy and gravitational energy, you can get much better net distance per unit of energy. Um, and so uh, to illustrate the general electrical principle here, uh, on any electric vehicle system, you have a battery pack. Everyone knows you have a battery, but the battery outputs more or less a fixed voltage. And you have a motor, and the motor, at least in the case of permanent magnet motors, it actually generates a voltage whenever it spins. And in between the battery and the motor, in order to modulate how much power is going to that motor, we have a box called the motor controller. And in its simplest description, what that motor controller does is it varies the voltage coming out of the battery and reduces it so that the motor sees a lower voltage. And so that way the controller can increase or decrease the power going to the drive and it can increase the speed of the vehicle by just moving its output voltage up and down. So if the output voltage of the motor controller is higher than the voltage that's being generated by the motor, you have power flowing into the motor. So the motor is generating power and spinning and it's sucking power out of the battery. But if the voltage coming out of the controller is lower than the voltage being generated by the motor, the power simply flows the other direction. There's no extra switches that are required. There's no changing uh, control system. It just automatically flows the other way. The controller will absorb power out of the motor and then it'll boost that to the voltage of the battery and have, cur have current flow into the battery pack. So the operating principle of regenerative braking is based on this idea of being able to vary the voltage that the motor controller feeds the motor. Um, now there's another type of uh, pseudo regen that you often hear people experiencing or talking about and that's when you're spinning the wheel so fast that the motor is generating a voltage that's higher than the battery voltage. And so this happens on e-bike systems. If you're going down a hill, even if it doesn't have regenerative braking enabled or you don't you know, enable, squeeze the brakes, at some critical speed, you'll find that, oh no, the bike is kind of being governed and you start seeing negative amperage flowing back into the battery pack. Um, this is not regen in the, in the normal sense because you're not actually modulating it. And it's not very useful because you can't use this principle in order to come to a stop. As soon as you fall down to a speed where the voltage generated by the motor is no longer higher than the battery voltage, this type of current flow stops. So when I talk about regen, I'm always talking about this type. When you're actually controlling it, and by varying this voltage, you can do regen right down to a dead standstill. So even if the motor is only producing two or three volts, the controller could do less than that. It could put out zero volts and you'll have power flowing back into the battery and you'll be uh, using the motor as a brake. Um, so that's uh, regenerative braking, but regenerative braking in order to function requires that the moving vehicle is able to spin the motor. And on a bicycle, uh, so this is, uh, and yeah, the, the core mechanical explanation there is that the, there can't be a freewheel between the two systems. Um, and so if you think about the world of cycling, on a normal bicycle, you can pedal to power the bike, but you can't use your pedals to stop the bike. If you stop pedaling, the bike keeps coasting, and the freewheel clicks, 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 and it causes the motor to spin, the wheel to spin, without forcing the pedals to spin. 
Um, but if you eliminate that freewheel and you have like a fixed gear bike, well now your pedals are in complete bi-directional torque control to the wheel on the back of the bike. So you can go downhill and absorb that mechanical energy with your legs to slow the bike down through the pedals. So just like you need not to have a freewheel for a bicycle to let you stop with your legs, there can't be a freewheel for the e-bike to stop via the motor. And unfortunately, that rules out regenerative braking for every single e-bike that's using a mid-drive system. Because a mid-drive motor is powering the bicycle, powering the wheel through the bicycle chain, and the bicycle chain always goes through a freewheel. Um, there's actually often a freewheel both in the motor and the freewheel that's in the wheel itself. So they're double freewheel. There's really no way that a mid-drive system can harvest the energy of the turning wheel to actually spin the motor. Um, I shouldn't should say no way, you could have a fixed gear bicycle, um, but if you have a fixed gear bicycle, there's no point of a mid-drive because you lose the ability of having variable gears. Uh, so that eliminates region from mid-drive e-bikes, which at this point accounts for the majority of the factory bikes on the market. And it also eliminates regen from almost all of the geared hub motors. Um, so the geared hub motor, what you see on the bottom right, um, these are the most common motors these days because they give such a high torque to weight ratio. There's a high speed motor inside that's geared to a much lower speed of the hub. Uh, and that allows them to generate impressive torque without being too big of a motor. Um, but built into the very design of these motors, they include a freewheeling clutch. And they include that because the, th the thought of the motor designers is that people want a motor that spins freely with zero resistance if you're not using it. And that is the perception of when anyone purchasing a bike that they want a bike that has no drag at all when you pedal it, that the wheel can just spin over like a normal bike hub. And by including a freewheel inside there, a mechanical freewheel, you absolutely ensure that. Um, so with both of these, uh, can't works accounting for the majority of their bikes, well that rules out most of the bikes on the shop floor from even having regen as a conceivable option. Um, and partly as a result of that, and the fact that this question about regenerative braking comes up, there's been a lot of marketing messages from the people promoting and selling these lines of electric factory bicycles, explaining and justifying away the fact that they don't have regen with the idea that regen is useless on an e-bike. And you'll see this parroted and repeated everywhere. You'll see it on forums, whether they're open forums like Reddit, you'll see it on the FAQ pages for companies selling electric bikes. You say, oh, whatever you get back is so minimal and pitiful, it's, it's not worth it, it's not worth it. Um, and not worth it is a funny thing, because it, a funny way to phrase it, because it means that there's some trade-off by getting regen, you're trading away something else. Um, and uh, um, so yeah, so what I'm here to talk about on this presentation is dive really into depth about that kind of worth it question when there is actually a trade-off here. Um, so at a core level, if you have a mid-drive system, you can't do regen, so it's not a question, it's not worth it, that's why you don't have regen. You don't have regen because it's physically impossible. Um, and with the direct drive motor, so that's a motor that doesn't have gearing and a freewheel in it, well then there's zero downsides to having regen. The motor is already fully capable of turning the, the putting energy back into the battery and slowing you down. Um, so worth it, of course. It would be absurd to market and sell a direct drive motor e-bike without taking advantage of the fact it can do regenerative braking. And luckily at this point, the few direct drive motors you see on the market do have regen. And so you'll see Rad Power has a bike with a direct drive motor. They include regenerative braking. Um, the Bionics D-Series systems back when they were still in production all had very well enabled regenerative braking. But it makes such a small, min minute share of the current e-bikes on the market that they're not talked about all that much. Um, so the only question of is it worth it is if you have a geared motor and then you have a choice of enabling regenerative braking and not having a freewheel or have a freewheel in the motor so that there's zero drag when you pedal the bike, uh, but losing the ability of doing regenerative braking. And that's an area where you can phrase that, is it worth it question quite specifically, because there's a trade-off to going. But the other two systems, there's no trade-off. Either you can't do it, or it's, you might as well do it because there's no downside. The geared motor, there is a potential downside to adding regenerative braking. Um, and uh, so yeah, so that question is one that was really front and center on my mind when I first got into e-bikes back when I was a student in 2003, 2004. And it was one of the main reasons why I initially started doing a lot of 
uh, analysis of what happens on bikes when you're doing regenerative braking and trying to capture the amount of information of that, the energy recaptured uh, that comes back. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this motor drag because it's also something that I feel is frequently overstated in this argument against, re against regenerative braking. Um, and so anytime you spin a, mag a motor that has permanent magnets in it, there's always energy that's going into the iron that's inside that motor because the iron's changing field. As the magnets move over, they go north, south, north, south, and the changing, constant changing of a magnetic field in a material induces losses. Um, it's not a core aspect of all electric motors. In fact, if you have an induction motor, or a switch reluctance motor, there's lots of other types of motors that do not have any drag when you spin them when they're unpowered. And you can see this if you, you know, have a washing machine motor in your basement, you can just spin the shaft and it spins totally freely. It's really a unique property of permanent magnet motors. Um, but the other unique property of permanent magnet motors is that they're incredibly power dense. You can get a lot of torque and power in a small size motor. And so in the world of trade-offs, it's definitely better to go with a permanent magnet motor and accept this drag than have, say, an induction motor on an electric bicycle, which would mean having, you know, 25, 30 pound motor um, to do what you can otherwise do with five to 10 pounds when you deal with the, the high grade rare earth magnets. Um, but to put it in context, if you actually measure what is the drag of turning a hub that can do regenerative braking, it usually falls somewhere between 0.5 to one and a half Newton meters. Um, Newton meters isn't a term too many people have an intuitive grasp of, uh, but to put that in the context of something you are familiar with, it's roughly the same as the amount of drag you have from the rolling friction of a wheel on the ground. Um, and if you're familiar with the energy losses in biking, you would know that most of the friction that you're fighting against is not the rolling friction, it's actually air drag. So rolling friction is, you know, anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of the drag, depending on how fast you're going. And having a region capable hub motor, it kind of doubles that. It's like having a slightly fatter tire or like knobbier tread on your tires. Um, and you can notice it. I'm not denying that that isn't a little bit of extra component there. Um, but it doesn't make it unrideable. People ride bikes with slightly flat tires all the time. Um, and, uh, and a lot of people couldn't tell the difference if you would just do a blind side by side. You really have to be quite attuned to your cycling experience. Um, and so that's the downside. The question of, well, the upside is you get energy back into the, uh, uh, back into the battery pack. Um, and this is a very interesting question. Like how much energy do you get back from regen? And what you hear all the time in the marketing messages on this anti-regen crowd, it's only a couple percent. It's kind of worthless. Um, we've now got experience going back decades with thousands of e-bike setups of people telling us how much they get in regen. We've logged trips from everything from cross Canada bike trips to cargo hauling around hilly areas like Vancouver. Um, and it's pretty darn consistent that in a city with a lot of stop and go traffic, you're pretty much always getting somewhere between five to 8% regenerative braking capture. Most of that comes from the stop and go. Just every time you decelerate, you're getting energy back. And then a smaller, maybe third of that comes from the fact that you've got hills in Vancouver that contribute even more to the regen capture. Uh, on the other hand, if you're going on a long distance bike touring trip in a mostly flat area, well, then you're biking stop and capture energy there. And then you just have the odd downhills that are part of that trip. You might only see 1%, 2%. Um, I've done some trips where I see 0% because it's just a completely flat trip the entire time. Um, at the other extreme of things, if you're dealing with a cargo bike, so if you're you know, carrying kids on your bicycle or doing deliveries for, for goods in the city, um, the additional weight uh, plays a huge effect in improving your percent energy recapture because you have that much energy when you're going down hills. Um, and we see 10 to 15% all the time. And people living in really extreme hilly areas, um, like in Seattle, um, and I've seen people posting us screen captures of 50% regen, 80% regen. Um, it's really you know, quite possible for it to be not just non-negligible, but a hugely substantial portion of the potential to improve their range. Um, so improving your range is one aspect of it. That question, is it worth it? To me, as sort of someone with a science engineering background, I always phrase it, well, is the energy that you get back from regenerative braking more or less than the energy that you spend overcoming the drag of the motor. And if the energy you get back from regenerative braking is more than what you spend overcoming drag, well, then it's totally worth it because you could use that energy that you got back in order to power the motor and negate the drag. And when we look at the analysis from that perspective, um, it's just a hands down slam dunk. Yes, 
um, you basically get from regenerative braking anywhere from 0.3 to 1 watt hours per kilometer. Um, and the drag from a, a direct drive motor on a bicycle, um, again, these numbers can vary up and down quite a bit depending on the specific model and how fast you're going, but it's between 0 to 0.2. And the drag is only an issue when you're riding the bike without the motor. So all the time you're using the motor, the drag is irrelevant because the motor is overcoming it. So you look at what percentage of my trip was I pedaling without the motor, and then how much energy did I expend doing that versus how much energy did I get back from doing regen. And what you see, um, it's not the nicest graph here, but the regen recapture is you know, three to four times more energy than what was expended overcoming drag on typical bike trips. Um, and once again, there would be an exception to this if you're, you know, say you're bike touring 100 kilometers, it's almost all flat, and you have your hub motor on the bike just to help you with the odd hill. Well, then over that long, long distance where you're pedaling without using the motor, overcoming the drag, you might not get back from regen what you expend overcoming it. But those are definitely the, the far exceptions from the rule. Um, but that's not the main interest in regen, and I feel a bit silly for going on these long tangents from just an energy flow perspective, because to me it's interesting. As a user of e-bikes, it totally overlooks the single number one biggest plus to regenerative braking, and that is having zero brake wear, zero brake maintenance, and totally uniform braking in all weather conditions. Um, and for some reason, this point is, is so rarely mentioned in talking both about the pros and the cons of regen, when as a user of an e-bike, it becomes the defining reason. I would use regen even if it used up my battery, even if regen drained my battery instead of adding to it, it would be worthwhile to me because I'm somebody who's horrendous at staying off to the maintenance and upkeep of my bicycle. I tend to wear my brake pads down to their screeching metal on metal. I've busted two or three rims, as you see on the bottom right here, by not replacing my pads until the, the metal inside the shoe was scraping against the aluminum and then the pressure caused the sidewall to pop out because it's just an annoyance. I want the bike to serve me and I don't want to have to be constantly tweaking and adjusting it to be well tuned up. Um, so with a well, uh, well implemented regenerative braking, you can do upwards of 98, 99% of your stopping energy through regen. You only really need the mechanical brakes if you have an unexpected emergency stop. So whenever you're in normal conditions, oh, there's a red light to the stop sign, you can use regen to come to a complete stop um, at the a comfortable pace of deceleration. Um, regen won't let you skid a tire out. And so if you're avoiding an, an unexpected thing, then you always want rock solid mechanical brakes that are there to, uh, to look after those stopping needs. Um, but, uh, but yeah, by using regen, you basically eliminate all conceivable wear on the brake pads. And what does that mean? Um, and this is something that you know, startled me the more I sort of thought about it. For, so prior to me, um, having regen on my own e-bike, I've gone through all different mid-drive motors, geared motors, direct drive motors, and for a long time I was running a geared hub motor, the one that you see on the left here. Um, and I use my bike; it's, it's a cargo bike, so I'm often carrying stuff with it. I commute pretty much daily with it, and I had to replace my brake pads two to three times a year. And those disc brake pads cost, you know, thirty, thirty-five dollars every time I had to replace them. And I'm not replacing them, I'm replacing them when they're totally worn out. So really, properly, I should have probably been replacing them a bit more often. And that lines up. If you read online, people say, oh, you should probably replace your brake pads every 1,000 kilometers, 1,500 kilometers. Um, and I'd easily be doing, you know, three to four, sometimes 5,000 kilometers a year riding. Um, and when you start to tally that up, well, you wind up realizing that you're spending close to $100 a year just on brake pad replacements. And if you think about the longevity of battery packs these days, the typical battery that we see on an e-bike now is lasting well over five years. I expect most of the bikes with a decent sized battery will still have a working battery in six to eight years from now. And in that six to eight years, if you don't have regenerative braking on your bike, you're likely to have spent as much money replacing bait pads as it would cost to buy a whole new battery pack. Um, what, the reason I bring up this side of the economy is because I've seen so many articles where people talk about the economy of regen and they're looking about how much money you save in electricity from the electrical energy going back in the battery and say, oh, like, you're, it's so pointless, you're going to get like 70 cents of electricity over the life of the bike, like, why waste, I have all this extra you know, complexity or challenge of regen if the energy recaptured is worth so little. And it just totally misses the point of where the benefit is for you as an e-bike user. Um, so, so yeah, I really want to put that aspect of the economy of regen into the picture here um, because it's significant. It's amazing to think that you think of an e-bike that the single biggest consumable expense is going to be the battery because there's $1,000 or $800 invested in that one battery pack. 
um, but your routine maintenance on mechanical stuff will actually exceed your battery replacement maintenance. And that's assuming you're doing the repair work yourself. If you go to a bike shop to have them tune it up and you're dealing with installation labor, of course, it gets substantially worse. Uh, so now we'll get into this point of uh, which motors can do regenerative braking. Um, so regen is an option. Whenever you have a direct drive hub motor, um, I should have had a slide just showing the inside guts comparing direct drives to geared motors, um, but you can recognize a direct drive motor because it's just quite large. They're typically about eight inches diameter. Um, and, uh, but it's also possible, as I mentioned, to do regenerative braking on a geared motor. The problem is, as the factory makes them, they have a clutch. Um, but it's quite a relatively straightforward process to somebody with mechanical skills to disassemble the motor and simply lock that clutch so that it's no longer able to spin freely in one direction. Um, so this, I don't, you can sort of see, but there's some weld beads around the axle there where we just, you know, took the motor apart, took it to a stick welder, seized it up, and now throw the motor back together, and now you have a geared motor that does regen. Of course, it's a bit silly from a manufacturing side to have a clutch and weld it. So ideally, we would have the motors assembled with just no clutch in the first place. And that's what we did with this GMAC motor, which was our first endeavor in bringing a production-ready geared motor that was capable of doing regenerative braking. Um, and it works fantastically. Like the, the combination of the, the lower weight and the better torque density you get from a geared motor with regenerative braking allows you to have a, a you know, complete come to a stop and a standstill with very rapid deceleration um, while still having the main benefits of a geared motor for that, that high torque density. Um, but unfortunately, it's not possible with all geared motors. And what we've noticed is that in the last few years, the geared hub motors, especially the higher end ones, have been using helical cut gears. So instead of the gears just having straight teeth that mesh, the teeth are cut on an angle, and that allows the gears to engage much more smoothly so you don't get sort of a vibration and a whiny noise. But whenever you have an angled cut gear, as that gear's transmitting torque, the angles cause the gears to put a little sideways force as well. So there's what you call an axial force in those gears. And frequently that axial force is stopped by what's called a thrust bearing. So here's a geared motor that we've opened up and you can see that there's this set of cylinders that are on the, on the flat there. Um, and what that does is it deals with the, the sideways force on the gear that happens because of the spiral cut. And unfortunately, if you try to do regenerative braking on one of these newer motors with this, this nice silent gear drive, they re when it's doing regen, it would pull the gear the other direction, away from the torque plate, and then you would have the gears bottoming out against things that they weren't intended to collide with. Um, so there are workarounds to that. It's trivial, though, of course, we have a thrust bearing on either side of the gear, um, but we would have to convince the manufacturer of these motors to redo all of their tooling to address what is right now a minuscule market, but I'm hoping that with enough promotion of this idea, we can start getting a bit more onboarding from larger companies uh, to change the norms of uh, pub motor design. So now I'm going to talk a little bit into just the actual practical aspects of regen on an e-bike. Um, and one of those is, well, how do you activate regen? Um, so mechanically, you have a mechanical lever that you know, pulls you know, cables through housings and causes calipers to pinch, and, uh, and that's well understood. Um, on an electrical system, your options for how you activate something are electronically are super diverse. Any number of ways you can control something with electronics. Um, now, the most obvious approach, how are we going to activate regenerative braking on an e-bike, is by just putting an electrical switch on the brake lever. And you'll see, in fact, almost all the e-bikes that are on the floor here are going to have a built-in switch on the brake lever. Even if they don't do regen, there's a requirement in BC that all electric bicycles cut power as soon as you squeeze the brakes. Um, so the ma manufacturers of these electronic braking systems are building these switches in them. So these are switches. It's just an on-off switch. As soon as you start to squeeze the brake, it closes the switch. And then as you squeeze it further, then the mechanics start to engage. Um, uh, in order for that to actually do regenerative braking, that signal has to make it into a motor controller. But the downside of this is that it's simply on-off braking. And so you could imagine driving a car where your brake pedal was just an on-off button, not quite ideal. Um, and in these setups that have just a fixed regen, they tend to not have it be too intense because you don't want to have a strong braking force all the time. Um, so they're good to slow you down, to decelerate, but you always end up doing the final share of your stopping mechanically uh, because the built-in braking force isn't strong enough for that and your percent recapture that I talked about earlier isn't as good and you still end up wearing down your brake pads. Not nearly as much, but they still end up getting burned down because you're maybe doing two-thirds of your braking via regen rather than 95, 99%. 
Um, there's other motor controllers that have a proportional braking input. And so if you want to vary the braking and in intensity, you have to give it some electronic signal that's saying, I want more braking force or I want less braking force. And that is a feature that is present on mo some motor controllers, but it requires connecting some sensor that's going to give it a signal of like, I want a little bit of braking or I want a lot of braking. Um, and uh, on the controllers that we do at Grin, um, we actually combined it so that the, the signal that controls how much power goes to the motor can also be used to control the braking by using a range of the voltage that is otherwise unused. So normally on a throttle, if you go above one volt, you're powering the bike, but from zero to one volt, that wasn't doing anything with a typical electric bicycle motor controller. So we said, well, how about, let's say, if you go less than 0.8 volts, it starts to do regenerative braking, and if that signal goes right down to zero volts, then it gets maximum regenerative braking. Um, and there's a lot of benefits to that because now we just have one wire commanding the controller whether you're powering the motor or doing braking. So as far as how do you control variable braking, well, the ideal solution would be to have a brake sensor, just as we showed earlier, but instead of it having just an on-off switch, it has a little sensor that detects how far you've squished the lever. So as you start to pull the lever a little bit, you get a bit of regen, you squeeze the lever more, that regenerative braking increases, and then at some point, you start squishing the brakes mechanically, so you have full regen, and then you have mechanical braking. And that has the best user experience from somebody expecting an e-bike to behave like a bike. You just squeeze the brakes, and the more you squeeze the brakes, the more braking you get. That's exactly what we're used to. The downside with this is that brake levers like this simply don't exist. And it's amazing to me that for all of the e-bike hardware, all the companies making accessories for electric bicycles, none of them are doing their brake system with an analog variable signal. It's all just an on-off switch. And I asked about this, I was in touch a couple years ago with TechPro, one of the major suppliers of e-brake components to the e-bike industry, and implementing this is trivial. Like it's the, you know, it's a lot of them already are using a magnet and a hall sensor, and you just, instead of using a digital hall sensor, you use an analog one. They wouldn't even have to retool anything. Um, and they just said, well, everyone's doing mid-drive bikes, we have no interest, nobody's asking us for this. The only people who want it are electric scooters, um, and electric scooters have different hardware system. So they'll make one for the scooter market, but we want a brake system that's compatible with bicycle braking components. Um, and to this date, I mean, there may be things out there. I, say, I said there's none out there. there. There probably are some companies. We've had an impossible time finding one that would actually ship us something. But that would be ideal. Um, in the absence of that, I'm going to go through now a list of other ways of activating regenerative braking. Some of these are workarounds. Um, some of them are actually quite attractive and interesting. Um, and uh, um, so the most straightforward is if you have a motor controller that has two, that has a, a throttle plug and a separate brake plug, you simply plug in a throttle to the brake plug. Now you have one side of your handlebars to accelerate, and then the other side you twist it to brake, and you just twist it further to get more braking force. Um, and you'll see a lot of people doing this. Uh, controllers like Kelly Controllers and some other brands that do variable braking, they give another plug, the, given the existing hardware that people have on their bike, the easiest way of then giving you that adjustable braking force. Um, but it's kind of awkward. It's not what you think to react to do to brake. You don't think of twisting a throttle. Um, one that would be really ideal, and this is why we had our, our single, when I said we can do regenerative braking with the throttle signal, would be if you had a throttle that could just twist in both directions. So you twist it one way to accelerate. When you let go, it goes to a neutral position. And if you want to brake, you just twist the throttle backwards. Right? That would be really straightforward, really intuitive. It would directly connect to the controllers that we sell uh, because you only have one, one signal that does the, the forwards and the backwards torque. Um, but again, this is something that I've not been able to find. The, the image here is from a company, Vectris Motorcycle, that had a motorcycle with this bi-directional throttle. Um, and, uh, but the companies making e-bike throttles don't, to, to my knowledge and all of my searching out there, give any offers for one that has a, a neutral point and then you can push it backwards to activate regenerative braking. But this would be really, really nice. Um, uh, so what our preferred workaround has been, and we've been doing this since about 2008, and that's to take advantage of the throttle that you have on your bike and the brake lever that has a switch and combine those two so that when you squeeze the brake to enable regenerative braking, the throttle, instead of now not doing anything, the throttle now varies that braking force. Um, so the attractiveness of this was simply that you already have a throttle on your bike, 
there's a gazillion of companies making great Swiss centers. If we just interpret those two signals coming together, we can now give everybody with existing hardware that they have on their handlebar a means of varying and adjusting the braking course as they're coming to a stop. So you can have a gentle brake when you're just trying to govern your speed. You can go maximum braking if you actually have a you know, sudden stop sign coming up in front of you. Um, but because it's, uh, as with the dual throttle things, it takes a little bit of getting used to because now your throttle is serving two. You have to mindfully think that when you're braking, pushing the throttle doesn't give you more power, it gives you more braking force. Uh, you quickly get used to it, but um, out of the gate, it's not the best UI user experience for, for varying this. Um, so then there's another approach, and this one is one that's also been discussed quite often, and I've played, been playing around with it also for about a decade, um, and that's taking advantage of the pedal sensor that's on the bicycles. Um, and so a lot of bikes don't even have throttles on them, but they do have a pedal sensor, whether it's sensing the torque that you're putting on it or just the pedal cadence. And there's no reason that those sensors couldn't detect backwards pedaling, not just forwards pedaling, and use that backwards pedaling as a trigger to do regenerative braking. So when I first thought, oh, this would be fantastic, then we don't have to deal with these pesky e-brake levers, we can give people region by pedaling, I kind of rushed to implement it in our control software. And I thought, well, it would be great if, you know, the slower you pedal backwards, the less regen you have. And then if you want to boost the regen, you just spin the pedals backwards faster. If you want maximum regen, you pedal backwards really fast. And in my head, that seemed like a great idea. Uh, on the road, it was the clumsiest thing I've ever experienced because you don't have any resistance when you're spinning the pedals backwards. And so to controllably pedal backwards or go fast, you're just kind of flailing your legs. Um, and, uh, and I realized that that was, and it also meant this constant, if you're on a long downhill stretch, to be constantly pedaling backwards the whole way down was just weird. So I kind of scrapped that approach um, and then more recently have implemented it uh, via two solutions. Um, so the, the second one that you see listed here is varying the braking force simply by how far you've rotated the crank backwards. So as you start to turn it backwards, you get a bit of regen, turn the pedals a bit more, you have more, turn them further, you get more. And at some point you'll have maximum regen. And then I've been playing around with like, what is the optimum amount of backwards crank rotation to get it to full region? If you do it, say, in just a quarter of a pedal turn, you might not be able to modulate your braking force very well. If you're going downhill, every time you hit a bump or move your legs, the braking is going to increase and decrease because a little change of motion will result in a big change of braking force. Uh, but if you have it where you need to, they spin the pranks backwards two full turns, you find yourself pedaling back or more regen. And then when you want less regen, you're pedaling forwards and moving forwards. And then if you want to power the bike, you have to do you know, one and a half pedal turns to unwind the regen and then power the bike again. Um, it seemed from, from my usage that a sweet spot was somewhere about a half a crank turn was great. You could easily vary the regen with this backwards position of your cranks. Um, and then if you wanted to get rid of it and pedal forward, well, it didn't take much pedaling for the power to become activated once again. Um, and uh, so some people really like this. Some other people didn't like this. So I, I've been testing this around a couple dozen test riders. Um, and one of the pieces of feedback I got, well, somebody, well, I love, so they, they were so used to the throttle region, they just still wanted to use a throttle to vary it, uh, but they wanted to trigger it from the backwards pedal. And the benefit here is you eliminate the need to add a brake sensor on the bike. So if you have an, an e-bike that already has an integrated braking unit, it doesn't have that built-in switch. This gives you a means of, of controlling the region without having to add an extra sensor. Um, and so we implemented that, and it works super well too. So you're just pedaling along, oh, I want region. You just move the pedals back a little bit, and now your throttle control's braking. And then the moment you want power, you just pedal forwards again, and then it gets it out of region mode and gets it into power mode. Um, so yeah, so I'm excited to see more of this happen, especially given the number of bikes that are increasingly running without throttles, as there's more interest in just pure pedelec e-bikes. Um, there's another means of controlling regen, and that's if you have a bike with an up-down power assist control, well, you can allow that down assist, instead of going the minimum assist being no assist, it can go down to negative assistance. You could actually go to regen and increasing the regen force as you uh, move down with that down assist button. And that's how actually the Bionic systems, which were sort of one of the first large distributed e-bike systems that had regen, um, how they controlled it. So you can see here, you know, this is put for maximum power assist. And then if you push the down button, you get maximum braking. And this gives just a steady braking force that's independent of anything else. Um, and you don't have to keep, you know, your throttle down or in position. And it's really wonderful if you're just doing a long downhill stretch, right? So now you don't have to hold your pedal at a given angle backwards to keep the regen you want. You just tap this button. If the regen's a little too weak, you can just increase it. 
tap the button once, you now have a bit more regen, and then you can get rid of the regen when you're back to wanting to power the motor. Um, uh, what it's not very good for is actually coming to a stop, because when you come to a stop, you kind of want to quickly go to maximum regen, and then once you stop, you want to get rid of it. You don't want to be in maximum regen, and then the light turns green, you start to pedal, but your system still thinks that you want to be your maximum braking force. Um, and so we found that the, the appeal of this was a bit limited more to that case of controlling region on a descent rather than coming to a stop. And coming to a stop is a really key uh, reason to do region. So um, there's another way of doing regenerative braking, and that is having it triggered when you hit above a certain speed. Um, so speed-limited regenerative braking is um, extremely useful, especially if you're in you know, lots of up and down hills on a longer touring trip. Um, it's super wasteful to go really fast on the downhill because you just burn all that energy to wind flow. Um, and by doing a speed controlled regenerative braking, you don't need any other sensors on the bike. As soon as the bike hits that speed where it does regen, it then starts to add the brakes automatically. If the hill gets steeper, it automatically increases that braking force to keep you at a nice steady speed. Um, and this is really uh, quite an, uh, an attractive proposition from a safety perspective because it means Riding in these areas with lots of up and down hills, you just effectively ride at a constant speed. It doesn't matter how steep the hill is, it's going to govern you at whatever you've set your regen speed limit, and you can set that independently of the, the limit for powering the bike. So quite frequently people might have a maximum power assist come out at 32 kilometers an hour, and then you might want the regen to only start once you hit 40. Um, and then on those longer downhill bits, you'll just do a nice steady 40 kilometers an hour. It'll always adjust itself to stay uh, at exactly that level. I should check, how am I doing for time? I'm, uh... Okay, I'm over time. <laughs> so I'm actually, I, I didn't realize how in depth this was gonna get. Uh, so I'm gonna actually just motor through quite quickly for the rest of these slides to get into a QA and a section. Um, uh, just quickly, another really interesting way of doing an regenerative braking is just having it controlled by the hill grade that you're going up. So have a, if you have an inclinometer or, or tilt sensor, then the system knows that you're going uphill or downhill and can just increase braking force once it senses you're beyond a certain percent grade going downhill. Uh, we've been experimenting a lot with this from the power side going uphills, and we'll be soon experimenting um, as controlling region on the downhill. And I think that this really should be the future of uh, electric bicycle control because so much of your adjusting of what you're doing is just based on are you going uphill or downhill. Um, and there's another means of controlling the brakes, which is to, instead of having the brake lever activate when you squeeze it, you could have it control regen when you push it down. So you could just have another sensor, you pull it to get mechanical braking, you push it downwards to get regenerative braking, just like those of you who have the combined um, brake shifters on road bikes and stuff. Um, so that is also a really neat one, but it would require quite a custom-made brake lever, um, which requires a certain minimum numbers before you can justify making it. Um, it often comes up, uh, frequently people ask, how efficient is regenerative braking? Uh, if you understand the reasons for regen, you kind of say, well, it doesn't really matter, mostly to save your brake pads, but if you get to it, motors are pretty much symmetric, so if it's 80% efficient as a motor, well, it could be 80% efficient as a generator, but uh, as with all motors, the slower you spin them, the less efficient they are, and the more torque, the less efficient, because you're often braking at a low speed at a high torque. You know, the motor's usually running in a worse efficiency zone, but as the main thrust is to save the brakes, it doesn't really matter if it's only 60% efficient when you're at the final bit of stopping, so then there's another really interesting question that I'll just, you know, you'd ask, well, are you better off? If you have a system with region, I get I get energy back, but I also know that a mid-drive motor is going to be more efficient when I'm climbing steep hills because you can put it into an attractive gearing. And so is the amount that you get back from regen on the downhill going to compensate for the reduced efficiency that the, the regen system has going up a hill? And that's like a fantastic question with an answer that it massively depends on the exact situation. Um, and just to illustrate this, if you just imagine this hypothetical hill that's really steep on one side and then it's a long, gentle decline on the other side. If you're going from A to B, from left to right, you start off with this really steep hill climb, the mid-drive motor is going to kill it. That. It's going to rock up the hills, you know, 75, 80% efficiency, not going very fast, but it'll be happy. You're not going to use too many amp hours. And then you just have this nice downhill where you're coasting, not really using any power at all. Um, and, uh, and it'll do great. The direct drive motor doing regen, it'll climb this hill, but the motor might be 60%, 65% efficient. And then the downhill isn't steep enough to do regen. It's a nice coasting downhill speed. So you're gonna get no regen captured and you're gonna use more energy going uphill. Mid drive kills it that way. Exactly the same trip, now you're going from B to A. Well, now you have this nice long gentle climb. Direct drive motors kill it on long climbs. Mid drive motors are no more efficient if it's just a, a modest grade because you still gear it to go decently fast. 
So both the mid-drive motor and the direct drive motor use the same energy to get to the top of the hill. And now the hill goes downhill, the direct drive motor does regen, captures all this energy back. And on the mid-drive motor, the sucker's just burning through their brake pads, throwing money away to you know, composite materials that are turning into smoke. Um, and so then in this way, the regen system works. So on any given terrain or trip, it could really vary which one would come out in the lead. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's the, the answer there. There's no single winner, but this, this illustrates why. Um, so the only actual downside to regen braking is that going downhills, if you do do regen, you're still using the motor, so the motor's still generating heat. And if you're constantly up, down, up, down, up, down, you're not giving a chance for the motor to simply cool off um, because it's working on the downhill, working on the uphill, and you can find yourself getting into the thermal limits of the motor more quickly. So if that's the case, then yes, you would either want to use your mechanical brakes on the downhill just to let the motor cool. Um, and the other final downside to regenerative braking is that every time you change the direction of the torque on, a, on the axle, um, you're causing the axle to wiggle a little bit. Um, and that constant back and forth wiggling, no matter how much you try to tighten up the nuts, it inevitably causes those nuts to loosen. So either you're checking every month to make sure that your nuts are tight, or you develop a system where there's simply zero wiggle to begin with. Um, and unfortunately, the stock torque arms and the standard slotted axle really isn't able to do that. If you're doing regen with you know, 70, 80 Newton meters, that's always gonna slip that tiny little bit, but a tiny bit of slip constantly again and again will eventually cause your nut to wiggle loose. Um, so the solution is to design the motors with the torque arm integrated, and that's what we've done with the GMAC, with our all axle motor, um, and then the torque arm is just affixed to the axle. It's not dealing with a potentially loose fitting interface plate. Um, or to design torque arms that actually pinch the axle. So this, um, it was an animated GIF, I'm not sure if it, no, it's not working right now. Um, but this gives you an illustration of a torque arm that we're hoping to release quite soon with a little cam lock that you twist and then it, it bites the axle from both sides and that ensures that it has no wiggle or play um, once it's installed on the bike. Um, so an easy mechanical thing to fix and once you've done that, then that downside's taken care of. Um, and, uh, and this, all of this led, goes back to my fantasy, first getting into e-bikes back in 2003, 2004, was having a zero maintenance bicycle. Um, and that's so achievable these days with a belt drive, an internal gear hub on the back, a regen capable motor on the front. Uh, now you have a system with no brake maintenance, with no chain maintenance, with no drive chain derailleur maintenance, nothing to grease, nothing to oil. Um, and you can just have pretty much, other than replacing your tires when they wear out, uh, something you just hop on the ride, use it and forget about it, um, and uh, don't get bogged down by the necessities of uh, constant maintenance and the costs associated. So thanks for entertaining the slightly long talk. Uh, I'm not sure if I have time for questions, but I'll put it out there anyway until someone kicks me off the stage. Oh, yeah? Sure, sure. Yeah. Hey. So my e-bike is Two batteries that are switched between 72 and 52 batteries. Yeah. And my question is, how would I tune my phase runner to accommodate both? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Uh, so that relates to the question, um, which I didn't really address, is well, how do you stop yourself from overcharging a battery from regen? Um, and uh, and this, uh, the simplest answer is you don't fully charge your battery to begin with, if, it's, if that was the nature of the question. Uh, it's best to charge your battery only 90% in the first place, and then you have a nice buffer to do regen, even if you live at the top of a hill. But in practice, even if you don't do that, there's no harm in briefly doing regen into a fully charged battery. You're only going 1% of an amp hour over what it would normally take. Um, his question was a bit more specific, which is that if you're switching, say you have a 36 volt and a 48 volt battery and you switch between them, how can you make sure that you don't overcharge your 36 volt battery? And by exactly the same method, you set the controller so it'll fully do regen with the 48 volt battery. And then when you're running the 36 volt battery, um, it just does, re it would theoretically be possible to overcharge it, but in practice, that'll never happen. Uh, the only time it would happen if you live not on the top of a hill, but on top of a mountain. So say you're on the top of Cyprus, coming down Cyprus, I could put two or three amp hours into a battery and then you, you would have to change the settings in your system to not do regenerative braking when your 36 volt battery was fully charged. Um, you could do that by programming the thing so it stops doing regen when the battery's at a certain voltage, or you can just observe the voltage on the battery and then just let go of it. And I kind of prefer the observer, observer you, let the person be in charge, but if you're making something for a mainstream user that's not attuned to that, then you can set a voltage limit in the controller, 
but if you did a voltage limit in the controller when you switch battery voltages, you'd have to reprogram the controller. Yep. Uh, so the answer is no, because that voltage won't exist. The battery will clamp the voltage to what its voltage is at. So even if the controller can do 72 volts of regen, if the battery is 36, as soon as current flows in, it's just going to clamp the voltage to 36 volts. It'll never see it unless the BMS trips, which is a, then a different situation. Um, but most batteries don't have a BMS circuit that will trip from regen on the discharge port. So. Yeah, sorry, a technical question, but definitely a, a one that really matters with people actually implementing these systems and especially dealing with more complex ones. Yeah, there's a... Can you combine the breaking? So the so combination I would see would be great would be the, the speed one along with the back pedal one. Yeah, yeah. The two of them together would be phenomenal. Totally. Um, so yeah, so I, I went over, not, I think I had nine different modes of activating regen. You can combine almost all of these. And in fact, the, the, the cycle analyst firmware 3.2 that uh, is available on our website in a beta stage. And on my own bike, I have, I have back pedal regen, I have the Digiox regen, I have speed limit regen, and I have brake lever regen, partly because I'm just getting used to it. Um, but yeah, there's no limitation in having all of those there at your fingertips. Um, but part of the goals with these other modes was getting rid of extra sensors if you didn't need them. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's a, neat, it's a neat area to explore. And when I talk about the future, I'm hoping that we can get enough people interested in talking about region that some of the big companies making high volume bikes will actually bring it into factory e-bike things and not just the world of the do-it-yourself space, because I think it has so much potential to increase the utility of an e-bike to being just like an everyday ride that you don't have to uh, constantly look over. All right, thank you very much. I'll leave the floor for the next person. Bye-bye.